Father, thank you for this time and uh, for the opportunity we have to study, Lord, and to learn more about the truth, to learn more about your word and the way that you have chosen to communicate to us and with us. Father, I pray that we would not uh, take your word for granted, but that we would see in it uh, the fullness of your intention, Lord, for what it is to be for each one of our lives. I pray that we would have a renewed sense of uh, communion and fellowship with you in your word, Lord, and that we would, by your Holy Spirit, hear your voice speaking to us in your word, or that as we read its pages, the divine voice from eternity would be breaking upon us and breaking us of sin, convicting us, Lord, of all the ways in which we are wrong and showing us all the glory and the splendor of Jesus Christ in the ways that He is right. Lord, help us see and hear and know You in Your Word. Lord, bless our time this morning. I pray for the discussion that it would be helpful and edifying, but also clear, and uh, that I would be strengthened by Your Spirit and quickened, Lord, to have a, a sharp mind and an ability to understand and answer questions and an ability from Your hand to present Your truth well and clearly. Father, bless us this morning. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'm going to forego the reading of that first paragraph for this morning. And... Uh, I guess as I, as I thought about, uh, thought through the questions and the issues that were raised in the class last week, uh, rather than individually addressing, individually addressing each one of them and saying, you know, identifying it and addressing it, um, I thought it would be more helpful just to try to address them in the class as we're walking forward today. So rather than spending half an hour at the beginning of the class addressing issues from last week, I tried to incorporate them into what was left of this lesson for us to discuss today. Now that's going to extend this lesson, and it may cause us to go into next week, which is fine. Um, but I bring that up just to say, I'm not going to individually speak about this issue was brought up by Bill, or this issue was brought up by Susan, or this issue was brought up by Chris. But I'm hopefully going to be addressing them in the content for today's class. If it's not sufficiently being dealt with to satisfy everyone's curiosities, please feel free to come up and ask for more clarification. Um, and if I ask you a clarifying question for my own sake, don't get flustered by that. I'm just trying to make sure that I understand exactly what you're asking so that I know how to answer it as best as I can. So I want to start today by clarifying what we mean when we are discussing the issue of revelation. When we're talking about revelation, we are speaking of the ways which God has taken action, the ways in which God has taken action to manifest himself, to uncover himself. We are talking about the ways that we as God's creatures perceive the knowledge of God that he makes known about himself. We are not talking about our ability as creatures to communicate the knowledge of of God to one another. Does that make sense? When we're talking about revelation, we are not talking about our ability to communicate what God has revealed about himself to others. We are talking about what God has done 
to uncover himself. It's his action, not ours. We can communicate what God has revealed about himself to others in various ways, but we do not possess the ability to reveal God to anyone by any means. And the simple fact behind that is only God can reveal God. Only God can uncover God to us. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 is an important verse in that regard where Jesus says, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Right? So the revealing of God, this uncovering of God, it is strictly and solely the work of God in making Himself known to us. Now, as we have discussed very fully, I think, uh, general revelation is the revelation of God made known through God's creation. And we see that in, in Romans 1.20, where it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, defined as his eternal power and divine nature, those invisible attributes have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that we are without excuse. So God has employed creation to make something known about himself to his creatures. Now, last week, a question was brought out uh, that basically was asking how much of God is made known through general revelation. Um, It, how many of you have an ESV in here? Do you have an ESV in your hand? Can one of you who has an ESV, can you read Romans chapter 1, verse 19, and just, I, I think it's just verse 19. Can you just read that out loud? Go ahead, Warren. Okay. For what can be known about God is plain to them, for God has shown it to them. That's the ESV. Let me read to you the NASB. Listen carefully. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Now, does anyone recognize the difference between those two translations? The ESV says, what can be known about God. The NASB says, what is known about God. Now, it may seem slight. It may seem like a small difference to you at first between those two translations. But there are massive implications that are, that are different behind the way that the ESV translates that verse and the way that the NASB translates that verse. The ESV, when it says what can be known about God is evident to them, is plain to them, that, that definitely opens the door wider on the possibilities of the knowledge of God made known through creation than what is allowed for in the translation of the NASB. So the ESV, it's the possibilities of what God has revealed about himself in creation that's being emphasized. What can be known about God is evident to them. The NASB, that which is known about God is evident to them. I don't know about the NIV. Yeah. Do you have it? Yeah, go ahead and read it. Yeah, that's interesting. The, the NIV goes right with the King James on that, where the King James Version translates it as that which may be known about God. Uh, I'll continue this. Go ahead, Mike. 
um, it seems like one of them that can be is coming from the point of view of God and the what is is coming from the point of view of man. So what is is the focus of what is known is focusing on what what man knows and what can be is from the vantage point of God but what can be known is from God I mean I, that's how I'm taking it but which which is more accurate um, based on the original um, the original language I guess yeah that's what we're going to get to um, that's exactly where we're getting thank you the the word here in Greek is not a verb. It's not dealing with what can be known about God, as if in the realm of possibility, right? This, this word here is an adjective. It's describing the content of what is known about God. And because of that, the, I, I believe the NASB is the more accurate translation of this verse. And the reason why I bring that up and just go into detail right there is because that came up last week, right? What can be known about God through creation? That makes it sound like God is being made known. What can be known about God? It's being made known through creation. Well, no, that's not quite what the Greek is trying to convey through in this verse. What it's talking about is that which God has revealed of himself in general revelation is evident to them because God has made it evident to them. Does that, am I losing anyone? I see, I see most of you guys are with me and I love that. What can be known about God is not the emphasis there. It's not on what is possible to be known about God through creation. The emphasis there is on the fact that what God has made known is very clearly made known, right? Because God has made it known to them. He's manifested it to them. The emphasis is on God revealing the truth about himself in creation to us all. It's not, about, it's not on the possibilities of the extent of the knowledge of God that's made known through creation. And um, to drive a nail in that forcefully... I wanted to read, can I, can I read this and then you make a comment? Yeah. It's okay, no, stay up here, brother, stay up here. This is from Charles Hodge, a uh, very respectable uh, commentator of, of the scriptures. Um, let me read to you what he says here uh, concerning the phrase, since that which may be known of God is manifest in them. That's the King James rendering. He says, this version is not in accordance with the meaning of the Greek word, which always in the Bible means what is known, not what may be known. Besides, the English version seems to imply too much, for the apostle does not mean to say that everything that may be known concerning God was revealed to the heathen, but simply that they had such a knowledge of him as rendered their impiety inexcusable. So it's not about everything that can be known about God has been made known through general revelation to the heathen. It's just simply stating that what God has made known through general revelation is enough to render all of us without excuse. And so, go ahead, Victor. The question came to my mind is, uh, what, uh, I have an answer uh, at the same time. Um, um, why we have um, different versions, like I have uh, NIV and uh, you have ESB or so-and-so have whatever. Uh, but, but at the end of the time, um, I read... Uh, and I be, and I, I, I feel pretty comfortable, and with full confidence that I 
comprehend and understand. And, and my heart and my soul told me that what I'm reading is true in the way I grasp, grasp and my heart is, is the truth. And I wonder if that's the reason we have um, different versions in our hands, even we in the same congregation. Um, by the end, by the end of the tabada, um, even if we have a different uh, way that we understand what we read in, uh, if we are a big group, uh, that we we have different ways that we view when we read the word. I think sometimes the by the end, if we put all the whole understands together, we probably point and by the same point. Get into the same end. Right. So even if we, sometimes we tend to don't agree the, in a way Victor understand the word or Helen understand the word, by the end of the day, we, we probably understand the same to the same direction, but yeah. they tend to have a controversial sometimes, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't think someone reading the King James Version of the Bible is going to come to a different understanding of the faith than someone reading the New American Standard Bible or the ESV or the NIV. I, I, don't, I don't believe that that's going to happen. But whenever it comes to issues where we're really having to look at a word and, and discuss what does this word mean because it's translated slightly different over here than it is over here. So how do we understand which one's right? You, this is definitely an area that we don't want to dig into right now. But you guys understand English translations, none of them are perfect, right? There is no inspired English translation of the Bible, which is why it's so important for pastors and leaders in the church to know Hebrew and Greek and be able to handle the languages adequately, right? To be able to present accurately what God has spoken, what God has truly inspired. We believe that that was... The original Greek and the original Hebrew is what God has inspired. And then some Aramaic there in the Old Testament. But we believe this is what God has set down as his word. He has inspired this by his spirit through his chosen communicators. The simple realities are that the original languages of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic at some points are very difficult to translate into English because there just aren't English words that capture the true essence of what this one Hebrew word is communicating. Um, now, we've, we have very, very good English translations of the Bible. We have too many English translations of the Bible, especially considering that a, a great swath of humanity does not have a translation of the Bible in their own language. We have too many. Um, so, but I want to make that clear. I'm not, I'm not degrading a translation of the scriptures by pointing out what I'm saying from Romans 1.19. I'm just trying to get to the point that that came up last week, and there's, there's a lot of implications involved in, in how you translate that verse. And so my point is just to say what is being talked about in, in Romans 1.19 is the knowledge of God that he has revealed of himself through general revelation. It's not all possible knowledge of God. It's just what God has chosen to make known through creation. So that limits how we understand what is evident to those who have never had the scriptures or heard the gospel. Miss Wendy. Regarding Revelations one nineteen, isn't the most important part of that verse that we humbly accept that the only things revealed to us are through God himself 
So whatever is revealed to us as individuals, whether we're a microbiologist, a physicist, or a farmer, is from God. And the subsequent paragraphs emphasize that in the confession, right? Um, well, I would say that a biologist or a farmer or whoever, when they come to a true understanding of what God has revealed of himself through creation, yeah, that, that I would agree with you there. What, the emphasis here is on the fact that God has made himself known, right? The, the emphasis is, is, is on God making the knowledge of himself clear. And I think that's what you're saying. Did I hear you wrong? Well, yeah, because the second part of the verse is as it's revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, there's the revelation in nature and creation and all of that. But as far as the depth of the fullness of God that he reveals to us as individuals, it's only through the Holy Spirit anyway. Yes. All right. There are things God has not revealed about himself in creation. All right. I think one of the most prominent examples is his name. God has not revealed his name through creation. You see that in Exodus 3 and in Exodus 6. In Exodus chapter 6, God speaking to Moses says, By my name I did not reveal myself to your forefathers. By my name, Yahweh, Lord however you want to pronounce that. The self-existent one. See, that's not made known through general revelation. God has to speak that knowledge of himself to us. He has to make it known. The Trinity. You cannot come to an understanding of the triune nature of the eternal God apart from special revelation. That is not revealed through general revelation. Um, How sin is to be atoned for. That is not revealed through special or general revelation. The fact that we have sin that needs to be atoned for is revealed through general revelation, which is why every religion in the, in the world has had some means of appeasing the gods for their sins, because that is an aspect of general revelation. But how that is accomplished is not revealed in general revelation. Go ahead. I... I... I probably not the right one to hear what Wendy was saying, but um, I I kind of see two different sides what Wendy bring on. Like by the Holy Spirit, we we taste the 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 goodness of God in our souls, but. But God revealing Himself, He never been a secret. He's He been revealed Himself since the beginning. The only difference is that we we not been tasting the uh, the way that we tasted us that we had the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Does that make sense? Uh, not quite, uh, to me. Um. And I don't mean to be rude with that. I just uh, it didn't didn't quite make sense to me. If you want to, you can you can try it again, brother, and uh, I'll patiently listen uh, and try. Um, um, last week we left off discussing whether or not this kind of knowledge of God revealed through general revelation has ever been enough for humanity in and of itself. So one change I want to make on your outline, if if you have an outline, you'll notice uh, the third bullet point right here uh, under special revelation section. It says, uh, or it asks, was natural revelation ever enough in itself to ensure accurate knowledge of God and his will? I want to make a change to that. That was not very carefully worded, uh, or at least one word there was not carefully chosen. It says there, was it ever enough to ensure accurate knowledge of God? 
Well, to that, we have to say, well, yes, it's enough in itself to ensure accurate knowledge of God. But what we're talking about is not the accuracy of the knowledge of God revealed there. It's the sufficiency of the knowledge of God revealed in general revelation. So the question ought to be, was natural revelation ever enough in itself to ensure sufficient knowledge of God and of his will? And to that, based on the testimony of Genesis 2, you have to say no. No, it was not sufficient in itself to make the knowledge of God and the knowledge of his will known the way that it needs to be made known for us to continue to walk in fellowship and communion with our God. Right? How would The example we brought out, how would Adam and Eve have, have known not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil unless God had verbally told them not to do it? Because right? based on their perception of that tree, Genesis 2.9, God made all the trees of the garden that were pleasing to the eyes and good for food, well, in Genesis 3, 6, when Eve looks at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she sees it as pleasing to the eyes and as good for food. So there was nothing inherent to the tree. There was nothing visually on that tree that made it look like, oh, that's not God's will for us to eat that tree. Right. It looked just like the other trees that God had provided. The only way they knew not to eat of that tree is that God told them, you will not eat from this tree. That is special revelation. Verbal communication from God. And that leads us to talk about the essence of special revelation. What do we mean when we talk about special revelation? What is it at its core? What is the essence of it? Uh, special revelation is often called propositional revelation. I think Bruce Ware has a very helpful understanding of what is meant by that phrase, propositional revelation. Uh, he says it's probably better to understand this as linguistic revelation. A revelation from God that is given to us by words, by speech, by God speaking to us. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about special revelation. It's interaction with God that is expressed in words. Uh, like the way God dealt with Adam. Right? He spoke to Adam. He, who else did he speak to? He spoke to Noah. Right? How did Noah know that he needed to build an ark for the salvation of himself and his household? It was by God coming to him and saying, build an ark. And then he told him how to build that ark to ensure the safety and the survival of uh, Noah and his family. Uh, with Abraham, how did Abraham know to leave his homeland and to go to a land that God would show him? How did Abraham know that God was going to use his seed to bless the entire world? Well, not through general revelation. It wasn't by sitting out under the stars and discerning it on his own. Right? It was the Lord God coming down and speaking to Abraham and telling Abraham, this is my will. I'm choosing you for this end. Now go. And Abraham obeyed. And you see the same with Jacob and with Moses and others throughout the history of the Jewish people. God revealed himself to them through verbal communication. Now, in what I was pointing out last week with Psalm 19, that's a whole lot different than the knowledge of God that's made known through general revelation. Right? Psalm 19, it speaks of a clear revelation of God's glory and the handiwork of God in creation. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork, declares His handiwork. But we noticed in 19.3, Psalm 19.3, that this knowledge given to us through general revelation is knowledge that is without speech. It is without words. There is no voice heard through this knowledge of God given in creation. And I um, just want to point out here briefly as we're trying to consider the confession too <laughs> in our discussion here, that the confession itself represents this difference in the way it's worded. When it talks about general revelation, you notice that second sentence, it says, the light of nature and the works of creation and providence 
so clearly demonstrate the goodness, wisdom, and power of God. So they demonstrate these things about God. In other words, they exhibit them. They put them on display. Right? But they don't, um, they don't speak these truths to us about God with words. They speak, them, they speak these truths to us in what they demonstrate and what they exhibit. But notice what it says about special revelation, God's communication through special revelation. Right in the middle of that paragraph, it says, Therefore, the Lord was pleased at different times and in various ways to reveal Himself and to what? Anybody have it? Thank you, brother. That's right, Victor. And to declare His will. Now, that's different than demonstrate, right? God has declared His will and the knowledge of Himself through special revelation. Now that means that special revelation is in its essence declarative in nature. As we've already kind of talked about, it's verbal. It's propositional communication from God. Um, And what we mean when we say propositional communication from God, we mean that it's logical, understandable, declarative statements of truth and facts about God. Everybody follow me with that? Yeah? Good. And again, the confession pointed to Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God spoke to our fathers and the prophets, but in these last days He has done what? He has spoken to us in His Son. Right. So either in the prophets or in His Son... God is still doing the same thing. One is more fully revealed than the other, right? The Son, God speaking in His Son, is the fullest revelation of God we will ever have. But either way, it's still the effect of God speaking. Speaking, verbally communicating to us. Now, what we want to focus on for the rest of our time is... One of the last statements that are made in this confession, or in the confession, in this paragraph, this first paragraph, let me read this sentence to you. After it speaks about God revealing himself and declaring his will to his church, it says, uh, to preserve and propagate the truth better and to establish and comfort the church with greater certainty against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and the world, the Lord put this revelation completely in writing. That's the phrase we want to focus on right there. The Lord put this revelation completely in writing. Now, not that you need this, but if you want a fancy word for what that's called, It's known as the process of inscripturation. And you understand what that means. It's the inscripturating of God's special revelation, writing it down. It's where, you know, scripture. God took what he revealed in special revelation and he committed it to a written form of communication, the result being the Holy Scriptures. Now, before we really dig into that part, why did God do this? Why did He commit His special revelation, His verbal communication to us? Why did He commit it to writing? And the confession gives two reasons there. One is to preserve it, right? We've all heard the charge, or maybe you guys know the game, telephone game, right? So if you have a a large enough group and you spend enough time passing one sentence along, by the end of that process, that sentence is going to be distorted. Right? It will not be the same as it was at the beginning. Now, I qualified that. I said if you have a large enough group and give it enough time. I'm not talking about ten people sitting in a circle in a room for just a couple minutes passing this message along. That's possible. But the knowledge of God revealed to humanity from the beginning, let's just take, for example, um, 
the reality of the flood, right? Do you guys know that many religions in the world have a flood narrative? They have a story about a global flood in which one family was saved, right? Now, they distort that. Some of them say it's because the gods were angry at some other gods, and they decided to flood the earth and destroy humanity in their rage, right? Uh, the tale of Gilgamesh is one of the most well-known accounts of uh, a mythological account of the flood narrative. Now, the flood is true. The flood really happened. But what happened in that distortion of it? Right? It was true knowledge that was being passed down from generation to generation orally. But what was the problem with that knowledge? What's that? Why? Why did it change over time? It's a three-letter word. Sin. That's right. It infects us all, right? See, it's not... What happens when you entrust truth to a sinful creature? That sinful creature is distorted in his understanding, in his perception of that truth... In his communication of that truth, it's always slanted to his own advantage, right? So what happens to that truth if it's just entrusted orally to a bunch of sinners? It becomes distorted. Now, if you take that revelation and you write it down, all of a sudden you have caused it to be preserved. No matter what someone else wants to say about that document or about that truth, it's written down. It's codified. Right, and therefore it's preserved, um, and that's well. We don't know. Almost, I almost took that dive into textual criticism. We are not going to do that in this class. Pastor Jim's like, Amen. <laughs> so God had it written down entirely in order for it to be preserved, and then also notice that second part. It's in order that it might be better propagated. It might be spread around more fully, more accurately, more ava- have more availability of this truth. You pick up on that reality of God's desire and heart to be made known in Jesus' words when he spoke about a lamp. Not being, you don't light a lamp in order to hide it under a basket, right? You light a lamp in order to set it on a table, and then what happens when you put that lamp on the table? It gives light to the whole room, That's what Jesus says. Well, that's the knowledge of God revealed to us. That's why it's written down so that it might be spread around and give the light of the knowledge of God throughout the entire world. See, because then once it's written down, you're no longer dependent on some special guru hiding up in the mountains to get this knowledge of God, right? You don't have to cross the deepest oceans. You don't have to traverse the widest deserts or climb the highest mountains, Right? The Word of God can come as close to you as the written form comes close to you. So as fast as it's copied, it can be spread around. And that's why one of the reasons why God had it written down. Not only to preserve it, but also to, to cause it to be propagated, spread around more fully. Yeah, that's funny. I just This is a side note here. I just uh, flipped on the back of my my notes, and I told you guys I'm not diving into the textual criticism deal. If you can tell that smaller writing at the very top, those are some facts about textual criticism. So I was even thinking about that in the study, but we're not going to do that. All right. Now, it has been completely put in writing, not only to preserve it, um, but also in order that we can all access it, that it's accessible to us. Now, I want to draw your attention in this phrase to a remarkable example of the careful wording that is utilized in this confession. I'm going to read that phrase again. In order to preserve it and propagate it and to comfort the church, to establish us against all of our enemies, the Lord put this revelation completely in writing. Now, here's the question. Who put this revelation in writing? The Lord. It was not men. 
It was not the will and desire of man. It was not mankind's best attempt to understand and capture and pass on their understanding of what God revealed. That's not it. It is the Lord who has put this revelation completely in writing. And why that's so important is because that in the confession is affirming what has come to be called verbal plenary inspiration. Verbal plenary inspiration. Now, I don't throw these big words around just to have them so that we can all know them or whatever and use them. This is, this is what, what we're talking... Okay, does anybody remember why the Trinity, the word Trinity was developed or coined? Have you ever spoken with a Jehovah's Witness and they come up to you and they say, well, you know, Trinity is not actually found in the Bible. Well, do you know why that word was developed or why that word was utilized is a better way to say it in describing the nature of God? Because that was the only word that could be used in order to weed out those who didn't hold a true view of God's nature. See, it's not, yes, that word is not found in the Bible, but it's describing the reality of what is found in the Bible. And so you have Arius and you have all of these other deviance, right, trying to undermine the reality of Christ's divinity, right, or his equality with the Father. Maybe some would acknowledge his deity, right, the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, well, yeah, Jesus is a God, but he's not equal with the Father. Well, no, that's not true. We believe in a triune God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing co-equally and co-eternally, Right, and eternal bliss and happiness together, fellowship, communion together through all the ages of eternity. Right? That word Trinity, we utilize that word in order to weed out those who do not hold a proper view of God as it is revealed in the scriptures. We're not claiming that that word is in the scriptures. Well, it's a similar issue here with this phrase, verbal plenary inspiration. This phrase was coined in order to weed out those who were not holding an adequate view of the nature of the Bible. Right? And let me get into that here just briefly. And this will be probably where we end today. Um, when we talk about inspiration, what, let's, let's begin by defining what we mean by inspiration. Uh, we don't mean that, wow, that guy was really inspired to write something good. Right? That singer, man, he was inspired. That poet was inspired. Yeah, that's good stuff. The Beatles, some might say. Well, I definitely don't agree with that. But no, that's not what we mean when we talk about inspiration. When we talk about inspiration, we are talking about the work of God through the influence of the Holy Spirit to ensure his truth revealed in special revelation is communicated without error through his chosen communicators. That's a full definition, and it's not perfect by any means. But that was my best attempt to compile all the definitions of inspiration for you and come up with something that was presentable. It is the work of God through the influence of the Holy Spirit in order to ensure that his truth revealed in special revelation is communicated without error through his chosen communicators. Okay? And we know some common verses for that. 2 Timothy 3.16. Right, what does it say? All scripture is inspired by God or yes, who said God breathed? I heard a couple of you. All scripture is God breathed. Right? that God by His Spirit was ensuring the infallible communication of His truth. The, the communication of His truth that is without error. It says all Scripture is inspired by God. That means all of it, well, we'll get to that, but it is, it is given to us without error. Second Peter 1.21, it describes the way in which this was brought about. Uh, 2 Peter 1.21, it says, No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, 
But men, yeah, here it is, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay? Now, if you, if you back up to verse 20, I'll read that one. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. It's not according to one's own understanding of something. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now notice those things there. It didn't come from man. Who produced these prophecies? Who birthed them? Who brought them about among us? Thank you. The Holy Spirit. Right? Now the Holy Spirit moved upon men. But when those men were speaking, were they speaking from themselves? No. It says here that by the influence of the Holy Spirit, these men were speaking from God. Right? One of my favorite examples is in Acts 4, 25. You turn there. We'll start reading verse 24. It says, And when they heard this, talking about the believers gathered together, praying, hearing the report from Peter and John, it says, When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, why do the nations, why do the Gentiles rage? Now notice there. God, by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, spoke. That's what we mean when we talk about inspiration. We talk about the God-breathedness of Scripture. God, by the Holy Spirit, spoke. And what are the means? What did He use to speak to us? Well, it says, by the Holy Spirit, men carried along by the Spirit spoke, right, from God. But notice that, that one little phrase here in the middle. Verse 25, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, spoke. Now it goes on to quote Psalm 2. David wrote that psalm, right? But it's being spoken by him. It's being declared by him in written form. But who's actually speaking as David pens Psalm 2? God is speaking. Right? And right here there is an intimate tie between the product of man's writing and that which has been spoken to us by God. Right? That it is God speaking when we read the scriptures that were written by the prophets. It's God speaking to us. And that's what we mean when we talk about inspiration. Now, to finish this section up, that second part there, or uh, we're working backwards through that phrase. So that was inspiration. Now that middle phrase is plenary. Plenary inspiration. What do we mean when we use the word plenary? Well, basically, the word plenary is dealing with the fullness of Scripture, the totality of it, all of Scripture. And so it's used simply to say that the fullness of Scripture is inspired by God. Everything the Bible teaches as true is true. And that's what plenary inspiration is talking about. All right, that, that inspiration extends to the entirety of Scripture. And again, I'd reference 2, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. It doesn't say some Scripture. It says all Scripture is inspired by God. That means that the accounts of the generations in the book of Genesis are just as much as uh, uh, the product of inspiration as the book of Romans is, right? Or that Leviticus is just as much the product of inspiration as the Psalms are. Right? 
Everything in Scripture, the totality of it, was breathed out by God for our benefit through His prophets. Now, here's my favorite part of that phrase. Plenary inspiration, yes, but they added a word to that phrase. It's not just plenary inspiration. It's verbal plenary inspiration. Now, who, who understands or who wants to guess at what we mean when we use the word verbal plenary inspiration? I mean, you have it right in front of you, I guess, don't you? I guess you don't need to guess. You just need to read, right? Here's what I have here. That the inspiration of Scripture extends not only to the totality of Scripture, but it extends to every individual word God chose to communicate His truth to us. So it's that every single word in the Bible is there because God put it there. Now, this was added to negate the idea that some hold that the process of inspiration is limited simply to the message of the Bible and not necessarily to the individual words or phrases that are used to communicate that message. So, for example, some would say that Peter was moved by the Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write First and Second Peter, But what was inspired about those letters is not the individual words Peter chose to to write that message out. What's inspired in those letters is the content, right? That message, the theme that's being conveyed through these letters. That's what's inspired by the Spirit, not the literal words that Peter chose to use, just the message that he's trying to get across. Now, is that an adequate view of what Scripture is? Is the Bible just a communication, a a, a man's attempt to communicate an inspired message from God? That's not what the Bible is. The Bible is God's infallible communication to us. It is His spoken word written for our benefit. And so verbal speaks of every single word being written down as being the actual product of of God's speech, God speaking, God breathing out to us. And we see this in the scriptures, for example, from uh, Matthew 5.18. This is what Jesus meant when he said, let me get there. Matthew 5.18, it says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Where was that at? I have there in parentheses Luke 16, <clears throat> excuse me, Luke 16, 17, just as another example of Jesus saying the same thing. He says, uh, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Now, when it's talking about, when Jesus talks about one stroke, or, or what we might, older versions would call a jot and tittle, right? he's not just speaking about the letter itself. He's speaking about the small little what would look to us squiggly lines or those little tiny indicators that distinguish those letters from other letters. So like in Hebrew, uh, you have these little, these little, uh, Pastor Jim, how would, you, how would you describe that? I mean, it's a jot and tittle, but... Tiny yeah, like the tiny horn. Little, little extensions that are on letters that distinguish one letter from another. Jesus is saying, not even those little distinguishers, these little distinguishing marks will pass away from God's law. Like, it will be preserved, is what he's getting at. And that speaks to the, the, 
the depth of verbal inspiration, that every little tiny mark of a letter will be preserved by God in His Word as His Word for us. Now that's a remarkable, that is a remarkable instance, not only of God's deigning to us, reaching down and interacting with us in this world, but also the preservation of His knowledge for us in this world. That God truly delights in us knowing Him. And He's going to ensure that that knowledge of Him is preserved so that we can know Him truthfully and worship Him in spirit and in truth. Right? That's, a, that's an amazing act that God has performed in giving to us His Word. Now my favorite text to point to, and I want all of you to turn there please, Matthew 22 When we talk about the verbal inspiration of the Scriptures, I just want to point out something here from uh, Jesus' discussion with the Sadducees concerning the resurrection. You guys remember when He was talking to them about uh, the woman, or they brought to Him a situation where a woman had been married to seven brothers, right? And so in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And they were trying to use that to disprove and discredit the reality of the resurrection, And so in verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. Literally, you're wrong. He says, you err. You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Now listen to verse 31. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, Jesus says. He's the God of the living. Now what's his point there? What is Jesus' point in referencing this verse where God says, I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Well, he's using that to prove that God is the God of the living, not of the dead, right? Now, if God, if his point here is, God does not say in that verse, I was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they worshiped me, and I was their God back then. No, God's point is, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. And Jesus uses that to prove the reality of the resurrection, of life after death, right? And the the hopeful resurrection upon which we will all be waiting in Jesus Christ's name. Now, my point in bringing this up, when we're talking about verbal inspiration, the fact that God has inspired every single word in his book, he has breathed every single word out. Jesus rests his entire argument on the tense of a verb communicated in the Old Testament. His entire argument of God's truth is being um, founded upon the tense of a verb, not a past tense, but a present tense. And that unveils to us a depth of inspiration that we have yet to begin to scratch. When we come to this book, we're out of time and I need to finish, but when we come to this book, we are not coming to just some letters that some men wrote about what God revealed about himself. Like when we open this book, God is breathing upon you. It is his very breath blowing upon you. As you read it, you're, you, are, you are having his voice given to you. And if you don't see the Scriptures like that, if, if that doesn't... Ex- if, 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 if the experience that you have with God in His Word is not that deep, then you have not gone very deeply with God. The Spirit takes His Word and He pushes it into your soul. He causes it to be felt. He cuts you with it. He encourages you. He speaks to you from His Word. And when you read the Word, we're going to get to this in the confession, and I'm already late, I'm sorry. 
This is the illumination of the Spirit of God taking the Word of God and causing it to be felt upon the depths of your soul. And that is because it is God's Word. And He owns it as His Word in that way. And I love that. I love that. So let's, let's pray briefly. Father, thank You for Your Word. Lord, we pray You would use Your Word in our lives mightily. Lord, and let us know that intimacy that You purpose for us to have in giving to us Your inspired word. I pray we would never read the word of God the same. May your spirit preserve us and keep us, Lord, and impact us with that word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.